would like to welcome Tina Shandlkamp Temke from Aarhus University. Uh, she has done her PhD at the National Environment Institute in Roskilde in Denmark, and after her several Denmark and also in Lund University in Sweden, she got a prestigious um, associate assistant professorship at the University of Aarhus in Denmark, where she continues to be. The focus will be is on, on life in the atmosphere and so how life affects the atmosphere in our on our planet. And she has been also a very frequent guest at our events, namely our summer schools that about uh, Tina. So I will conclude now my interaction with that and give over the words to you, Tina, and the floor is yours. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Wolf, for the introduction um, and thank you for the invitation. Um, so I will uh, talk a little bit about our research um, on organisms uh, or microorganisms in the atmosphere and what is their implications uh, for astrobiology. So um, just to start with, um, um, on Earth, um, there are different atmospheric particles that, has, that are really significant in terms of our climate um, and cloud formation, which I will talk about a little bit later on. And these uh, particles can either form in the atmosphere, as uh, you can see here, the secondary particles from um, volatile compounds that will um, um, nucleate and grow into particles, or they are emitted as primary particles already from Earth's atmosphere. Um, and some of the most abundant particles are sea salt, uh, mineral and soil dust, uh, volcanic ash, um, but also a large fraction of these particles are biological particles. Um, and that can be um, microorganisms, uh, fragments of organisms, dispersal units, or molecules uh, that are produced by different organisms. Why um, are we interested in these particles or um, in these uh, biological particles? Um, that is um, for different reasons. So today I will mostly focus on the astrobiological implications. Um, so well, one thing is that atmospheric dispersal um, is one of the key ways um, that microorganisms use to disperse um, locally and globally. And that has been so since the early colonization of land more than two and a half billion years ago, where um, um, such microbial mats occupied um, land surfaces. And these organisms um, had to um, disperse through the atmosphere to colonize land masses. And they had to develop special adaptations, um, which are, for example, um, being resistant to ra radiation, um, being resistant to um, desiccation, very dry environments. Um, and even up to today, atmospheric dispersal plays a very important role um, as it still conducts the dispersal of microorganisms um, as well as genes, um, both on local but also on global scales over distances that cover thousands of kilometers. So the second um, interesting um, point um, that has to do with atmospheric microorganisms is that um, atmosphere, um, as also like these early land masses, is also quite a stressful environment. So um, there is, uh, uh, it's highly radiative, um, there is a reactive oxygen species, um, it's uh, a very um, um, low in water so availability. Sorry? You can hear me well, I hope. Yes, everything is fine. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I'll just continue then. Um, so um, the, the water availability um, is very low. Um, there are um, large um, shifts, so the atmosphere is very dynamic. 
so organisms are exposed to um, cycles of wetting, drying, uh, freezing, thawing. So um, they need to develop special adaptations to be able um, to both successfully survive their atmospheric dispersal, but also if they need to sustain some kind of metabolic activity um, that um, also requires uh, special adaptations and understanding these adaptations um, may expand our understanding of uh, the limits of life and what kind of environments can actually serve as microbial habitats. And the last um, um, topic that I will talk about um, is that um, specific um, groups of uh, microorganisms and their, the compounds they produce um, can affect the formation of clouds, um, which um, has um, potential impacts on the global climate. And um, if um, such impacts on global climate exist, this could be in future utilized as a kind of no novel biosignature um, when we search for life on exoplanets. So this is for a short introduction. Um, and then I will um, talk a little bit about these first two aspects um, at the beginning. And then I'll talk about um, the cloud impact and uh, biosignatures in the second part of my talk. So um, a lot of uh, the research that we do, um, it's actually a combination. So um, we um, do research um, mostly in polar regions. So in the Arctic, uh, Greenland and in Antarctica, where um, we do field campaigns um, to investigate atmospheric microorganisms. Um, we collect samples. Um, with um, devices um, that either can uh, suck air into liquid um, and where, when this air streams through the liquid, um, the particles and microorganisms get trapped in this liquid um, before the air exits again. Um, in this way, we can collect very large volumes of air, hundreds of cubic meters of air, and really concentrate microorganisms um, from this environment. And then we also use um, sampling on filters. So um, we mount filters in such a device that then uses vacuum pumps to suck air onto a filter. Um, and this is quite low maintenance and you can also automize it, um, but it will sample lower volumes of air typically. Um, and this, um, in C2 studies, so the, um, the field studies, we combine um, with doing some um, laboratory simulation studies that I will also talk about a little bit. Um, but I start with um, some field studies um, at the beginning. Um, when we collect um, these samples, uh, the um, different types of analysis that we do is we can uh, quantify the cells. Um, uh, typically, we use um, some stains that will enter the cells and um, bind to DNA um, and then fluoresce. Um, and then we can um, either count the cells um, with a microscope or we can use more automated um, um, techniques. Um, for example, this flow cytometry where um, cells are quantified um, um, according to their fluorescence um, as they stream um, through um, this um, instrument. Um, and then um, we can learn more about um, the um, identity um, of uh, microorganisms um, by um, sequencing. So we extract DNA molecules. Um, we can also extract RNA molecules, which um, give us more a proxy for the activity of these organisms. Um, and um, we can um, either use these molecules um, to um, quantify specific microbial gr groups. For example, we can be interested in bacteria, um, so we can quantify bacteria, um, or we can also um, use um, um, sequencing techniques to say something about um, the, the diversity and the composition of different um, microbial species in the samples. And um, here is uh, a couple of examples um, from Southwest Greenland and from Antarctica, where we looked into 
where are these atmospheric microorganisms coming from, which kind of environments. Um, and for that, um, we collect atmospheric samples um, and we collect source samples. So we um, look into different aqueous environments um, like seawater, freshwater, um, sea ice. Um, then we look into um, terrestrial environments like ross, rocks, permafrost, soils, um, plant surfaces, um, wherever they are present, mostly in the Arctic. Um, and then we try to link um, where are these atmospheric microorganisms coming from. And um, here, um, based on the sequencing, um, we can say something about um, what the similarity between the different samples. So here um, in Southwest Greenland, you can see the air samples here in blue, and they are um, sitting very close to soil samples um, and um, plant material samples. So um, terrestrial environments often serve um, as an important source for atmospheric microorganisms, um, as in that location. Um, and that is, um, for example, one mechanism would be mechanic action, um, such as um, intense winds, as you can see here on the pictures, that will then um, mobilize um, either particles from soils or organisms from plant surfaces that then get detached from the surfaces and then carried into the atmosphere. So, um, Antarctica is a little bit a different um, example because the terrestrial environment is not that um, diverse, so there is um, a very little plant life, um, and the diversity of microorganisms in terrestrial environment is it's, um, lower. Um, and here you can see um, that these um, blue, um, and, um, which are air samples and uh, the uh, snow samples are in pink, they will be more closely related to marine samples here in blue and green. Um, and um, they are, so there in that location, marine environments served as predominant sources for these atmospheric microorganisms. And the way they get aerosolized is um, that um, during wave breaking, uh, large um, volumes of air are introduced into um, the sea column and then they disintegrate into smaller pockets of air and in the end small bubbles will form in the water column that will um, travel up the column and collect um, microorganisms, different compounds on their surfaces. Um, and then when they arrive to the, to the surface of the ocean, they will burst and eject tiny droplets into the atmosphere. Um, and so this is the predominant uh, mode of aerosolization from marine surfaces. So both um, terrestrial and marine surfaces can serve as, um, as a source for atmospheric organisms. Um, and in um, the Earth's atmosphere, um, um, the, the troposphere, which is the lowest part of the atmosphere, is right, uh, quite dynamic. It's very well mixed. So um, typically, these organisms will stay in the atmosphere perhaps um, just a few hours if they are emitted just uh, to very low parts of the um, troposphere called the boundary layer or um, if they get to slightly higher levels of the troposphere, then they will disperse longer distances, but the typical residence time will be about a week or maybe 10 days. So they don't stay much longer than that, and then they will um, deposit back um, due to gravity and other forces. We here um, in this uh, one of the studies, we also were very interested in the activity um, of these um, bacterial cells in the atmosphere. Um, we um, used a special technique where we could collect the cells in a solution that fixed them in real time. So they were fixed and no activity could take place afterwards. Um, and then we could quantify um, the cell numbers 
and we could quantify um, our ribosomes in the cells. And um, I'm not sure that everybody is familiar um, with the term ribosome. Um, uh, ribosomes are um, uh, macromolecules that are present in all cells and are involved in protein synthesis. So um, when cells um, have a large number of uh, ribosomes, um, such as here, um, then they can synthesize uh, proteins on short time scales. So they have a very short response time. While if they have a small number of ribosomes, then first they would need to um, um, synthesize more ribosomes before they can produce um, uh, uh, proteins, so the, the, there would be a delay in their response to um, um, uh, good conditions, um, good environmental conditions. So, um, and that is very important in the atmosphere because, as I mentioned, the residence times are low, um, so they don't stay in the atmosphere for a very long time. So, if they need, want to um, have some sort of activity in the atmosphere, um, that has to be on short time scales. So um, it is an advantage for the cell to have um, a large number of ribosomes already present in the cell. Um, so that is what we quantified here. And um, you can see um, the cell density um, um, as these um, bars. Um, and you can see the ribosomal cell content as these dots. So on average, um, and these are the different samples. So we have collected samples over a couple of weeks. Um, and what we could see on average is that there were um, uh, on the average around 500 ribosomes per cell on a community level. And this is quite a high number if you compare to what has been found in permafrost or on the surface of um, glaciers. So that was quite an interesting observation. And we also wanted to see whether um, all cells um, uh, had this high activity potential or was it some specific groups of bacteria that had that. So we could um, look um, using the sequencing technique, we could look into um, different types of bacteria. And here you can see some different um, groups of bacteria. And um, this is um, their activity potential. So more uh, the, the bluer the color, the more um, ribosomes they would have in their cells. And I have pointed to some groups um, so there are some actinobacteria, some cyanobacteria, um, some um, clostridialis that are um, consistently active across um, uh, the samples. And um, what is very interesting is that um, these different groups that have a high activity potential in the atmosphere uh, nowadays um, overlap um, quite well um, with this group of bacteria that has been um, um, termed Terra bacteria. Um, so you can see um, that these Terra bacteria consist of cyanobacteria, clostridia, actinobacteria. Um, and these are the bacteria that have been proposed as first uh, colonizers of land masses. Um, so this it would be interesting um, to see whether some of these um, ancient adaptations um, to um, uh, low water availability, uh, high radiation that these early land colonizers um, used um, are now still um, beneficial when it comes to atmospheric dispersal. Another interesting observation um, that we have made um, um, in the same study was that um, this um, ribosomal cell content um, on the community level was correlated with water vapor pressure. So um, the more available um, water vapor um, the cells had, the higher um, was this um, average ribosomal cell content. And this um, made us very much interested in, um, in the relationship between uh, microbial cells in the atmosphere and um, water vapor, as well as um, 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 transitions um, between uh, water states. 
So um, we um, um, uh, studied um, this question um, um, using um, laboratory simulation studies for some years now. Um, and we are using a model species, um, which is a plant surface uh, bacteria. It's a uh, gamma proteobacterium um, called Pseudomonas syringi. The reason why we use um, this as a model species is that it has some um, uh, cloud active properties, um, which I will talk about um, later on in the talk when I move to this um, um, cloud impacting uh, part. But um, so we use this model species, um, which we now know uh, quite well. And we were interested in how it responds to aerosolization and what is its relationship to um, atmospheric water vapor. Um, so um, the first uh, study that we did is we like, wanted to see how the mode of aerosolization um, impacts the survival of um, these uh, model species. And we compared um, two different um, modes of aerosolization. One is um, this bubble bursting that I have talked about um, 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 as a, the main mode of aerosolization from aquatic um, environments. So um, this is when a bubble um, forms in a water um, body and then um, bursts. Um, ejecting small droplets into the air. And we have a setup to um, produce these droplets um, and introduce them in a conditioned flow tube um, where we can keep constant relative humidity. And then um, when they travel um, through this flow tube and get um, equilibrated with this relative humidity, then we recollect them um, with a um, sampler and we can um, then analyze the samples um, and look into different uh, properties or their the response to this uh, process of aerosolization. And the second um, uh, mode of aerosolization um, would be that there is a droplet with bacteria on a surface that dries, and then um, these cells would get aerosolized due to wind action. And it was very interesting what we observed um, comparing um, these two modes of aerosolization um, is that when they got aerosolized um, with this um, uh, bubble bursting, um, the, the, the survival was much higher than when they dried on the surface first. So about 30% of cells survived um, this bubble bursting aerosolization, while um, less than 1% survived um, drying on the surface. And what we think um, happens is that um, the, the evaporation time of these tiny droplets, um, which are um, produced with this bubble bursting um, mechanism and are just micrometers in size, um, they will um, evaporate in a matter of um, below seconds or maximum few seconds, depending on the relative humidity here. Um, so the, the drying time is really short, but here where we dry droplets on a surface, these droplets will be um, microliter sizes, so much bigger droplets, and they will be drying on time scales um, of, of, of between minutes and hours. Um, so, so this um, um, prolonged drying apparently has a negative impact on the viability of this model species that we studied. The second um, question that we were interested in was um, what uh, happens after aerosolization? Um, once um, these cells are in the atmosphere, what is the ability of these cells to attract water vapor as a function of relative humidity? So we used uh, um, a device that is um, used a lot in atmospheric physics. It's called hydroscopic tandem differential mobility analyzer. I won't go too much into details, but the basic idea is that you make 
some aerosols um, and you dry them so they are completely dry so we did that with our bacteria and then um, we select um, the 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 um, a size, a size, the major size. So in this case, this was 800 nanometers, which is um, the aerodynamic size of bacteria when they are aerosolized. And then um, we um, expose them to higher humidity and measure their size again. So if they um, accumulate water on their surface, their size will increase. Um, and then we can measure this with this method. Um, and what we did is we um, tried that with clean cells um, where we grow the cells and then we wash them um, in very pure water. And what we can see is um, here you can see growth factor as a function of relative humidity. Growth factor is the ratio between the second diameter after humidification and the dry diameter. And what you can see here is that they don't grow very much when you increase relative humidity. So they grow less than 10% in their size. So they are actually um, not very good in attracting water vapor from the atmosphere. But this um, really changed when um, we aerosolize the cells from um, water that, can, that um, is similar in its composition to um, seawater. So if we had um, cells that were aerosolized um, from a, from a uh, yeah, simulated seawater uh, solution where they were having some salt crystals on their surface, um, then they behaved um, very differently. And again, you can see the growth factor as a function of relative humidity. Um, and the bacterial cells are here in this blue um, dots. And you can see that not, nothing changes, nothing changes until you reach some kind of threshold humidity, which is around 75%. And then suddenly um, the aerosols grow in size and then they grow rather big. So they become nearly double in size. Um, and that is um, actually typical um, for salt. Um, so for the way salt behaves um, in terms of accumulating water vapor. So just for comparison, you can see these green, um, uh, these, uh, these green symbols, they, they show how salt, pure salt will behave. So when cells are associated with salt, then they will be able to attract much more uh, uh, water vapor, which is dominated by this salt coating on their surface. So actually, again, the, the, the environment from where they aerosolize and the mode of aerosolization can have a big impact um, on the relationship with water vapor once they are in the atmosphere. The next um, thing we were interested in is um, how um, this relationship with um, water vapor can um, support uh, metabolic activity of cells. So um, we are um, pretty sure um, that when cells are in liquid environments, such as in cloud droplets, that they can sustain some kind of metabolic activity. But um, not, not much is known um, about the atmosphere that is um, subsaturated um, in um, water content. So when you have um, high relative humidity, but no liquid water present, is there um, a possibility for um, metabolic activity? Um, and um, um, uh, we uh, performed these experiments, or this was done by um, our PhD student, Corina, um, um, that um, she developed this kind of um, chambers where um, we can put um, cells on a filter um, and then place them um, inside such a small chamber where um, we have um, a saturated salt solution that controls the relative humidity at specific values. Um, and then um, she uses um, deuteriated water um, to create 
um, uh, uh, water vapor around uh, the single cell sitting on a filter and um, she incubates these cells um, for about a week and then um, um, uh, this instrument called NanoSims at the University of Vienna is used to analyze um, the incorporation of deuterium into single cells. So um, what uh, Corina has found um, is that here um, you can see the the percentage of deuterium incorporated and then you um, there is um, the relative humidity so she tried 100 percent relative humidity 97 and 94 percent relative humidity and then compared that to the natural abundance um, of deuterium in the cells and you can also see how the raw data looks um, from the instrument um, um, with the natural abundance and 100 percent relative humidity um, and what you can see is that there is clear incorporation at 100% relative humidity, but also um, probably some incorporation at lower relative humidity, which um, indicates that um, actually these cells are able to use um, water vapor um, at these high relative humidities to sustain um, basic metabolic activity. And now um, we would like in future to build um, on that. Um, so um, we would like to look into um, gene expression. And for that, we are building um, um, a chamber um, that we call biosim chamber. And that's um, an, it's an electrodynamic balance where um, we can charge particles, in that case, um, bacteria, um, and then keep them suspended in an electric field. Um, where we can observe them with a camera um, or a kind of microscope um, while they are exposed to realistic atmospheric conditions um, in terms of humidity and temperature. And um, we want to couple that to a technique um, where um, we produce uh, reporter strains. So these are bacteria that are modified um, in such a way that when they express specific genes, um, you can um, detect um, the gene expression as a fluorescent signal. So um, in that way, we would be able to directly demonstrate activity um, under a realistic atmospheric um, conditions um, um, in real time using these microscopic observations. Um, so this is um, still under development, but we hope um, that um, it will be ready and validated later this year. Okay, so um, this um, was a part um, um, concerning the, the adaptations um, to atmospheric dispersal um, and um, to um, um, maintaining metabolic activity in the atmosphere. Um, in that sense, um, expanding our understanding of the atmosphere as a kind of new um, possible habitat. And now I will move to the second part of my talk, um, where I will talk about um, cloud formation and how atmospheric microorganisms can impact cloud formation. Um, and this um, hopefully in future could be used as a um, new biosignature. Um, so I'll just start with a little bit of background um, 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 on Earth. Why are clouds important on Earth? It's because they cover quite um, a large fraction of our surface, around 70% um, of Earth's surface um, on average is covered by clouds. Um, and clouds um, are a, a planetary surface with a very high albedo. So um, they are very good in reflecting solar radiation back into space. And um, in that sense, they have a cooling effect on our climate. Um, this cooling effect um, depends a lot on the microstructure of clouds. So here is just one example. If we have a cloud um, with um, a small number of large um, cloud droplets, um, then um, this will be few surfaces for solar radiation to reflect on, um, and these uh, clouds will appear dark. 
Um, while if we have um, a large number of small droplets, this will increase the surface area um, and um, there will be a lot of surfaces for solar radiation to reflect uh, from and that those clouds will uh, appear more white and will have a higher albedo. And that depends a lot on the number and type of aerosols in the clouds. Mm. Now, um, um, one um, type of aerosols will aid this um, formation of droplets. Um, but there is another process that is extremely important in terms of um, cloud um, microphysics and optical properties, and that is the formation of ice in clouds. Um, and um, um, that is because when we have a droplet formation in clouds, um, this is very pure water. So um, this uh, very pure water will not freeze um, when we um, um, go to sub-zero temperatures, but it will stay in a kind of um, metastable um, um, condition. Um, and you can actually decrease the temperature all the way to about minus 40 degrees. Um, before this very pure water will freeze spontaneously. Um, so um, in this window between zero and uh, minus 40 degrees, um, there needs to be special particles in clouds that will facilitate this freezing. Um, and um, what has been observed, so there was the, there is a lot of studies that look into many different particles that are present in the atmosphere. And here is a review, um, a, a figure from a review study where they have um, assembled all the data. And here you can see the concentration of these ice nucleating particles as a function of uh, temperature at which they are active. Um, and just to simplify, these um, yellow and orange um, shaded areas, these are um, associated with mineral dust. So they are quite common particles um, which are active at rather low temperatures. So typically below minus 15 or even below minus 20 degrees Celsius. Now this green part of the, of the figure um, that is associated with biological particles. So biological particles are able to nucleate ice at much higher temperatures, um, somewhere between just below zero and above minus 15 degrees. And that is because um, there are specific groups of microorganisms that can um, synthesize special proteins, which are um, um, evolved to have um, surfaces that are really good in um, um, initiating ice formation. So these are um, the so-called ice nucleating proteins. And as I said, they have this um, special um, temperature range at which they are active. Um, now, um, how, um, when it comes to how relevant um, these uh, um, high temperature ice nucleators um, are, um, in our atmosphere, there has there are studies where they can look into um, clouds using remote sensing techniques for um, either with satellites or with ground-based techniques. And here is a study where they looked into um, the fraction of clouds containing ice crystals as a function of the lower temperature in the cloud. And what they find is that even if the temperature, the lowest temperature in the cloud is um, just minus 12 degrees Celsius, um, still 80% of these clouds will already contain ice crystals. Um, and that can only be explained by the presence of um, this biological material in these clouds. So um, during past um, decade, um, th this has really arisen a lot of um, attention um, both um, from um, microbiologists, but also from atmospheric physicists um, to look into how important actually these particles are for Earth's um, cloud formation. Um, aside from um, impacting the optical properties of clouds, there is another process 
um, that um, importantly gets impacted by ice formation in clouds, and that is the formation of precipitation. Um, and that's because um, when we have cloud droplets, they are typically in the size range of around 20 micrometers, maybe 100 micrometers, but they cannot actually grow to much bigger sizes that would be necessary for them to um, fall down due to gravity in form of precipitation. So um, um, the 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 con conditions are never right. You would need um, um, very high um, supersaturations for that. Um, so um, the, the two things can happen. Either these small droplets will um, collide with each other and form bigger units, um, and then like form units big enough to fall down as precipitation. This is a process that typically occurs over oceans. Um, and the second process involves ice formation and typically occurs over um, continents. And that is when you have a coexistence of um, cloud ice and um, droplets, um, there will be a, a, a lower water vapor pressure over ice, which means that ice will grow preferentially compared to a water droplet. So what will happen is that this um, ice particle will grow in size. Um, and the water droplets um, in the clouds will evaporate um, and um, supply um, with extra water vapor. And eventually, these ice particles grow big enough um, to form precipitation sizes, and then they will fall down. Um, and typically, they will melt down, um, melt on the way down. So that's why we perceive them um, as liquid rain. But the majority of precipitation over continents um, forms in this way. So actually ice formation um, is not just important for the optical properties of clouds, but also in terms of um, their lifetime um, and as well for the whole um, global water cycle. So um, I'll just say a little bit about some research that we have been doing um, on um, this um, microbial ice nucleating proteins in the atmosphere. Um, so um, aside from the, the way we analyze samples that I already explained about, um, here we use another technique to quantify um, the ice nucleating particles and proteins. And these are the so-called uh, droplet freezing assays where um, we take samples and then subdivide them in um, small droplets. So these are 30 microliter droplets that are placed in such a um, sample holder, um, such a plate that can contain nearly 400 samples. Um, and then um, these um, are um, highly temperature controlled. So we can decrease the temperature in a very controlled way um, below zero degrees and down to minus 30, um, and then observe the droplets with the infrared camera. So we can uh, measure um, the temperature of individual droplets. And then when, they, um, when the ice nucleates, there is a latent heat release um, which is also detected by this infrared camera. And you can see um, that as these bright spots. Um, and by performing these experiments, then we can quantify um, how many ice nucleating particles there were um, in a volume of sample. So we have um, um, done um, a, a, a field study here um, in Northeast Greenland at the Willem Research Station, which is um, one of the northernmost um, research stations in the world, um, where we have collected um, over 50 air samples and also some surface snow samples to look into the presence and properties of these ice nucleating particles that we can find there. Um, and these are some pictures um, from um, late spring. So you can see that it's a very frozen environment uh, covered with some meters of snow. Um, so there, um, in spring, there are very um, little local, uh, exposed local sources, except for um, snow and ice. Um, and then in summer, 
um, the snow melts um, and exposes some terrestrial and marine surfaces in the surrounding. So we looked into how um, the summer and the um, spring concentrations compared um, and you can see here the concentration of these ice nucleating particles as a volume of air um, in, in volume of, in uh, per cubic meter of air as a function of temperature at which they are active. Um, and what you can see is that um, when um, we compare the summer concentrations, which are here in green, to the spring concentrations in yellow and red, um, that the summer concentrations were about an order of magnitude higher. Um, which makes sense because in spring, um, only long distance transport mostly contributes to these concentrations, while the, uh, the local sources are not exposed. And in the summer, we have some local sources. Um, and in fact, we saw that um, one of the samples that was um, full of um, um, uh, soil dust um, from the area was very high in this ice nucleating particle. So it may be, it may be that um, the soil dust could play an important role. Um, then uh, one uh, thing that we look into is um, whether these um, particles react to heating because proteins get denatured by heating. Um, and that is one of um, the tests that we can use to say whether these particles have a proteinaceous nature. And what we could see is that when we heat the samples to um, 100 degrees, the activity is significantly reduced compared to unheated samples. So that would propose that these um, are um, some sort of proteins. And then, um, Another thing we wanted to look into is how they um, correlate with the presence of bacteria in um, the same air samples. And what we could find is that um, this um, green, uh, sorry, the red, the red um, dots and the red lines are for the ice nucleating particles that are active at minus 10 degrees. Um, and you can see that they correlate really well. So here we have a concentration of the ice nucleating particles and then uh, bacterial concentrations on the x-axis. And they correlate really well um, when it comes to their activity at minus 10. While when we look at um, lower active particles um, active at minus 15, this correlation um, doesn't stand anymore. So um, um, from this, we uh, conclude that these uh, highly active ice nucleating particles um, are either of bacterial origin or like they are coming from some environments where there is um, high microbial um, uh, productivity. So um, this, um, in a way, gave us more confidence that these um, the, 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 the particles are in fact biological because they are heat um, um, uh, heat deactivated and they correlate um, with um, microbial concentrations. But um, the study was still, um, per, uh, we collect air samples on ground, um, but not really fr from clouds. Um, and we were very much interested what happens actually when um, one looks into the clouds um, and um, I got an opportunity um, a, a few years ago to um, go to a research station that was not in the Arctic, it was in Slovenia, um, but it's a, it's a research station that is very often um, in clouds. So what um, um, we could do is we could sample from clouds and collect um, just the droplets and the crystals separately, and then the particles that are sitting in between um, the droplets and the crystals called interstitial aerosols separately. And I mean, this allows us to understand um, whether um, these uh, microorganisms that we are looking at um, would be very good um, in forming cloud droplets um, so that they would end up in this cloud droplet fraction. And this is also actually a prerequisite for them to induce ice formation. 
So this was um, something that we wanted to explore in this study. And these are some of the last slides I will show now. Um, so our um, an initial hypothesis was that um, these microorganisms would be very good in forming cloud droplets because um, they are quite large compared to other atmospheric particles and the large size actually matters when it comes to formation of cloud droplets. But to our large surprise, um, we saw that um, actually the numbers that we found in these dry um, fraction of the cloud were much higher um, than in the fraction of the cloud that consisted of cloud droplets and ice crystals. So we got a, um, a significant fraction of um, bioaerosols that were not activating into cloud droplets. Um, and another thing we could see is when we look into the communities, and here we looked both in bacterial and fungal communities, because in temperate regions, both bacteria and fungi are very important in the atmospheric um, micro, microbial communities. We can see that um, the same uh, microbes, so the, the, you can see that the dark are um, the dry ones and the, the light ones are present in droplets. And they are very similar um, communities um, that are found in the dry and in the wet fraction, which points to the fact that there are not, no specific um, species or um, taxa that are very good in forming cloud droplets. Um, but it, it seems to be more a matter of chance. Um, and then um, we, um, the final thing we were interested in is their ice nucleating properties. And we uh, observed a very similar thing. So that um, very few of these um, biological um, ice nucleating particles um, were um, found in cloud droplets, but mostly they were found in this dry state. Um, and that is really surprising um, and um, um, may mean that actually they may have a problem in forming ice um, if they cannot first form cloud droplets. So this is like some a uh, couple of studies that I wanted to present. Um, and um, this is the type of information that we get um, with our um, with our field studies and with our laboratory um, simulation studies. And then this type of information can be used um, in different types of models. Um, so either um, weather models or climate models. And then um, um, it's actually the modeling that then can um, give a more global picture of, uh, on what um, would be the climatic consequences, what would be um, the, 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 the difference in optical properties of clouds and their cooling effect. Um, and as an outcome, um, right now we are trying to figure out whether these processes are important um, on, uh, on Earth um, and um, if um, they have a, some kind of um, biosignature um, on Earth, then um, it would be um, um, in future very interesting to see whether they can be used um, on other planets um, to detect um, potential microbial life in the atmosphere. So I would like to um, thank you very much and I'll just um, leave um, these uh, take home messages maybe during questions. And there is actually the first question on the chat uh, from um, Pedro Mustelas. How can you prevent the liquid medium where the sample is collected from freezing to the low temperatures that may exist? And secondly, thinking of something in other words, maybe the solar system would be a bit about the need to look for other sample methods to collect a larger volume here and they might be allowed when using dry filters and a wider range of temperatures. 
Yeah, is thank, that yeah, thank you very much for the questions. I mean, this is something we really struggle with. Um, so when we collect in liquid, um, we uh, I mentioned that we um, use this um, fixation liquid, um, and that is um, really high in salt concentration. So we use uh, an ammonium sulfate, very highly concentrated ammonium sulfate solution. Um, and that has a freezing temperature of about <laughs> minus 20 degrees. Um, so that is how we can collect um, into liquid. I have also tried to mount some heaters um, when using um, more water or buff, like just buffered systems that are not so high in salt, um, but that is quite difficult um, to maintain without freezing. So these high salt solutions um, may offer uh, a solution. Yeah, and for sampling in other worlds, <laughs> I think um, there are some um, uh, ways where one can sample um, very high volumes of air on a filter. So there are some specially designed filters where you can um, create quite a high flow. So maybe that could be um, an option. But um, typically these samples are also collected for quite um, long periods of time. Um, so um, a day or a few days. So it's not just something that you grab very quickly like with other types of samples. So that may be a limitation. <laughs> 